So we have already talked for a while about various kinds of ambiguity. And today we're going to talk about ambiguity more. This is, if anything, the best time to talk about ambiguity because we're now actually into semantics. Uh, the kinds of ambiguity we were talking about before were kinds of what's called, sometimes called structural ambiguity. That is, sentences that had more than one meaning, uh, the way we were talking about it, was more than one, had more than one meaning because it was possible to draw more than one tree for them. So the sentence that we spend a lot of time talking about was, I once shot an elephant in my pajamas, where the whole joke there was uh, uh, that in, in my pajamas could be attached in a couple different places. Uh, it could either modify the elephant or it could modify the verb phrase, shot an elephant. And the upshot of that was, well, uh, uh, that the pajamas could be on either of you and yeah, uh, ambiguity. Similar kinds of ambiguities in these other examples. But there's another kind of ambiguity that was, that's the one I want to talk about today. Um, people have claimed that this sentence is ambiguous. Someone loves everyone. Um, the claim is, <clears throat> this can mean at least two things. It can mean, um, let's see if I can get some lights on up here in the front. Uh, oh dear. So many options. Um, stage left, stage right. Yeah, sure. Oh, I see. That's what I want. Um, uh, two, two kinds of meanings for this that people have posited. One meaning um, in which it means uh, the following situation holds everyone is loved. That is, uh, for each person, there is someone that loves them. Um, that's what's sort of uh, diagrammed in that first diagram up there where the love relation holds between X and A and B, X loves both A and B, and between Y and C, and between Z and both D and E. Right, so that's a, that's a possible reading for the sentence. And then there's another possible reading for the sentence, and then there are arguments about whether this is a different reading or not, uh, in which it means, you know, someone loves everyone. What that means is there is a person who loves everyone. Maybe it's my grandma, you know, very loving person. She loves every, absolutely everyone. Um, and so the love relation holds between X and absolutely everyone, including herself, hopefully. Yeah. So that's a kind of ambiguity people have claimed to exist. I don't want us to get too hung up on whether it does. Um, there are clearer examples, maybe. Think about a sentence like, everyone in this room speaks two languages. Uh, so this is going to be a clearer example because we'll see that it, the availability of the two meanings is, uh, can be affected by things that we can do. What's something this can mean? Yeah. For every individual in this room, it's true that that individual speaks two different languages. Yeah. So it's possible that it means everyone in this room is bilingual, right? So maybe I speak English and Spanish, and you speak, you know, Ukrainian and Polish, and you speak Mandarin and Japanese, right? So everybody in this room is bilingual, right? Could mean that. Um, what's another thing it can mean? Yeah. Right, exactly, yeah. So if you took a survey of everybody in this room and found out all the languages that they speak, there would be two things, two languages that we all have in common. Maybe we all speak English and we all speak Tagalog, right? Uh, maybe some of you speak 12 languages, right? But two of them are English and Tagalog. Right? That's another thing that it could mean. Yeah. That's not the first reading you get for it. Yeah, I agree with you, actually. Um, so that, what you're sort of claiming is that if I were to say, everyone in this room speaks two languages, namely English and Tagalog, your interpretation would be that everyone in this room is bilingual in English and Tagalog. Tagalog is a language from the Philippines. Um, uh, it's a lot easier to get that reading, I agree with you, than it is to get the other reading, where it just means everyone in this room is bilingual. Yeah. Uh huh. Every, everyone in this room speaks two languages between us. Yeah. You feel as though there could be modifications that you could make that, that would make that reading. Here's one modification you can make that makes that reading come out. You can passivize the sentence. So two languages are spoken by everyone in this room. 
I think has that reading really clear. There are two languages that we all have in common, right? It's possible that it can also mean the other thing, right? that it can also mean everyone in this room is bilingual, but at least can mean that. The fact that we can have this, this sensation that you know, these two imaginable readings are maybe both available for both of these sentences, maybe not, but certainly one is more available than the other, uh, uh, depending on whether the sentence is active or passive. It suggests we want to be able to talk about this, this kind of difference in meaning yeah, between these sentences. So we're going to develop the tools to do that today. All right. So in order to do that, we're going to need to develop a theory of a certain special kind of noun phrase, what's called a quantifier. Um, so and to do that, we're going to start by talking about what noun phrases mean kind of more generally. So here's a noun phrase. Uh, refers to a person. He's the TA for some of you. Yeah. Um, uh, and if you were to ask, what does that noun phrase mean? Well, we talked about this a little bit. You know, I had the example of uh, you, there are various things that you could use to refer to me, right? Uh, you could refer to me as Professor Richards or as Norvin or as that so-and-so who gave me a C, right? And we were talking about that. Um, so similarly, here's a phrase that if you ask what it means, uh, you might expect that if we look this up in your mental lexicon, uh, what we would find is a picture of this guy. Uh, those of you who have him as your TA, at least. Um, some of you don't have him as your TA. Maybe you don't know who he is, but he's one of the TAs. And to say, for example, Enrico Flor is an avid hang glider is to say something like, you know, if we ask what that means, it's going to mean something like, uh, we'll have to figure out the meaning of avid hang glider. You know, what, what is it to say that someone's an avid hang glider? But when we figure out what that is, we'll have a list of all of the people who are avid hang gliders. And this claim is that that list will have Enrico Flor's name on it. Right? That's what that means. OK. So that's a comparatively simple kind of meaning for a noun phrase. Enrico Flor, that noun phrase refers to that guy. What if I wanted to tell you the 24900 TAs are avid hang gliders? So again, we're going to have a list of the avid hang gliders. What does this sentence uh, say? What does it mean? You sort of have to parse what the 24900 TAs are yeah. and decompose that into a list of people yep. to match them up with who's, who are the avid hang gliders. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a nice way to say it. So you know, we're going to have a list of the avid hang gliders, and we're going to have a list of the 24900 TAs. It'll have Enrico Flor, and it'll have Yash Sina, and it'll have you know, uh, all, all four of the, the, the TAs. And what it, this says is, if you look at that list of avid hang gliders, it'll have all four of those names on it. Yeah. OK? I'm trying to lure you into a false sense of security here. So far, this should seem pretty simple. So yeah, there's a list, or a set. We've made it a set here. It's a set that contains Enrico and Peter and Yash and Anton. Yeah. And, uh, what we're saying is that set is a subset of the set of avid hang gliders. Okay. What set does every Italian? Enrico Flor is Italian. What set does every Italian refer to? If we're going to let noun phrases refer to sets. Mm -hmm. Italian ancestry. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you're you're being very careful, but yes, right. So somehow we'll have to define what we mean by Italian. You're right. That's right. Uh, and then you know we'll end up with a list of Italians, <laughs> and then you know so that'll that'll be the set. So similarly, if you say every Italian is an avid hang glider, what we mean is it's kind of like the 24900 TAs are avid hang gliders. You know, everyone in this list is also in this list. Everyone in this set is also in this set. That's what that means. Yeah. So every Italian will have a list of Italians. There's some, that's how the list could start, you know. And uh, uh, you're saying everybody in that list is an avid hang glider. OK? So far, so good. How about no Italian? What set is that? Yeah? Like if you took the set of all people, but you took out all so the Italians. Subtracted the Italians. <laughs> <laughs> OK, but if it means that, no, that's a nice idea, right? So, so uh, we'll take the set of people and we'll subtract from it all of the Italians, everybody who was on the list of Italians. But then what is no Italian as an avid hang glider going to mean? 
Yeah. Just means that of the list of people that you identify as Italians, none of them will be found in the list of Italian names. Yeah. Well, so we want to we want it to mean that. But if it meant what Raquel wa if ever, no Italian meant what Raquel wanted it to make, I'm sorry, Raquel, I'm picking on you because you were smart enough to make a suggestion. It would mean everyone who is not Italian is an avid hang glider. And that's not what no Italian is an avid hang glider means, I think, right? Sorry, what, what were you going to say? Say that, yes, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, I should start calling on you guys instead of, uh, yes, Raquel. If there is an avid hang glider, it has to be part of the, the like, subtracted, like the, the set that doesn't have Italian. It's not that like, mm -hmm. every single one must, but like, if there is going to be one, it better be in that. So all the avid hang gliders have to be in the complement set of the set of Italians. Yeah, yeah, Joseph. Yeah, so I think what we're saying, what we're what we're getting to, and I think you said this more or less in the same way. Uh, every other set that we've talked about, you know, when we said the twenty four nine hundred TAs are avid hang gliders, we said yeah, there's a set of twenty four nine hundred TAs and there's a set of avid hang gliders, and the first set is contained in the second set. That's what that means, and. Every Italian is an avid hang glider. There's a set of Italians and a set of avid hang gliders, and the first set is contained in the second set. Yeah. But no, as in no Italian, makes you have the sets interact with each other in a different way. It says uh, this first set is not contained. Nothing in this first set is contained in the second set. Right? So this is a popular way of talking about the meanings of what are called quantifiers, words like every and no. Right, so it's not the null set. It's not a set containing no Italian. Uh, um, uh, a popular way of talking about the meanings of these kinds of expressions, these are called quantifiers, these expressions which uh, do fancier things with sets than just say, oh yeah, this set is inside this set. Um, a popular way of talking about them is to say, yeah, they, they, well, they do fancier things with sets. They allow you to do uh, more interesting things with set interaction than just say, this set is a subset of that set. That's what they do. That's what they're for. Yeah. Quantifiers have a bunch of interesting properties. Um, they're weird in other ways, too. So for example, there is something called the law of contradiction. Um, if the law of contradiction says, if you take two predicates that are contradictory, like be inside and be outside, if you join me in imagining that it's not possible to be both inside and outside, right? That, uh, so, and I can see some of you, you know, thinking of alternative ways of thinking about the world in which, you know, but suppose, you know, I'm halfway inside and halfway outside, which one am I? You know, I'm in the Department of Linguistics and Philosophy, so I'm used to hearing people talk like that, but please, please stop. Yes, so just, just, just imagine that you are either inside or you are outside, and that's all. And imagine that Paul is a single person, there's only one person on Earth named Paul, right? So uh, then, <laughs> Paul is inside and Paul is outside cannot be true, right? That's the law of contradiction. So if you have two predicates that are uh, opposites of each other, right, cannot both be true of a single person, then if you apply them to a single person, then, you know, that person, then, then the sentence has to be false. That's what that first example is, an example of the law of contradiction. But there are quantifiers, like several Americans, which just flagrantly violate the law of contradiction. So several Americans are inside and several Americans are outside. You know, no problem, right? And you, you don't have to play games with whether if you're halfway inside or halfway outside, or you know, you're, you're inside the building, but you're outside the campus or something. Just forget about all that. Yeah. Um, there are also quantifiers that fail what's called the law of the of excluded middle. The law of the excluded middle says if you have two predicates like be under six feet tall and be over five feet tall. Um, then a sentence like Takashi is under six feet tall or Takashi is over five feet tall has to be true. We don't have to measure Takashi to find out whether that's true. Because the set of people who are under six feet tall and the set of people who are over five feet tall overlap. If you have both of those sets together, they cover all people. Any height that someone is, they are at least one of those two things, possibly both. Someone who's between five feet tall and six feet tall is both. And someone who's under five is under six. And someone who's over six is, well, over five. Does that sound right? These are two predicates such that, you know, here's five feet tall and here's six feet tall. And we're talking about 
people who are under six feet tall and also the people who are over five feet tall. Well, we've covered everybody. Yeah. So we don't have to look at Takashi. We don't have to know who Takashi is. Uh, um, that first sentence is true. Takashi is under six feet tall or Takashi is over five feet tall. No. But the second sentence is false or at least doesn't have to be true. So all Japanese men are under six feet tall or all Japanese men are over five feet tall. Uh, that could be false, right? Can somebody name a context in which that would be false? I'm asking you to do it because I can't do math while standing up here. Yeah, Joseph. Yep. In the population of Japanese yep. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Good. So as long as you have at least one Japanese man who's over six feet tall and at least one Japanese man who is under five feet tall, the rest of the Japanese men can all do whatever they want. The sentence will be false. Yeah. Okay, good. So uh, quantifier phrases, quantifiers, uh, quantificational expressions like all Japanese men or uh, some Italians or no Italians uh, uh, fail these, te these sort of uh, otherwise, uh, otherwise reliable generalizations about um, sentences. OK, so expressions like no Turks or several Americans or all Italians or most Ukrainians don't refer to sets of people. What do they mean? Well, uh, what they do is they, I've already said this, this wor these words at the beginning, like no or several or all or most, are uh, doing cool set theoretic things with the set that they are combining with, so the set of Turks or Americans or Italians or Ukrainians, um, they're causing that set to interact in interesting ways with a set that's determined by the rest of the sentence. So in order to talk about this, let me do a quick review of, uh, of set theory. Um, you, you're not going to need to know very much set theory in order to do this. Uh, I tell you this because I don't know very much set theory, uh, and I can do this, so, uh, so I'll, uh, I'll just show you um, show you what I'm going to show you here. Um, here are two sets, pi and phi. Yeah, the Venn diagram is hopefully not too unfamiliar. Two sets, pi and phi, which have an overlap uh, that contains d and f. And then there are also things that are only in pi and not in phi, like a and b. And there are some things that are only in phi and not in pi, like c and e. Does that sound right? People are all familiar with Venn diagrams. Um, we say that d and f is the intersection of pi and phi, uh, and that little uh, hoop is the, the thing that you use to express intersection. Um, and we say that A, B, C, D, E, and F is the union of pi and phi, uh, where I have for some reason used the word of twice. I'll try to fix that before I, I put up the slides. Um, and the, the little thing that looks more or less like a U is the, the expression for union. Um, we also say that A, B, and D is a subset of pi. There's a, a symbol that's used sometimes for subsets. OK. OK. None of this seemed alarming. Subsets, union, intersection. OK. okay. So here's a popular answer, uh, which we've now already gone through. For a quantifier meeting, what we say is when you're saying something like all Americans eat junk food, is you are um, asserting a relation between the set of Americans and the set of junk food eaters. Um, you're saying something about what happens when you uh, intersect those two sets. Um, and depending on what quantifier you're using, you're, you're making different assertions about the relation between these two sets. So all says set number one is a subset of set number two. Sum, what does sum say? Yeah, Joseph? The intersection is not Yeah, the intersection is non-empty. Yeah, so there are things that are in both sets. Yeah. No says the intersection of set one and set two is empty. No Americans eat natto. Are people familiar with natto? We talked about natto in this class. Yes. Some of us are from natto cultures. OK, natto is uh, a Japanese food. It's, um, it's very good. Uh, uh, and it's good for you. It's high in protein. But it's one of those kinds of food. I think a lot of cultures have something like this. It's a kind of food, one of the points of which is to feed it to outsiders so that you can watch and be amused. <laughs> um, so this happened to me when I was living in Japan. We were visiting some, the family of a Japanese friend of mine. And 
the mother made me up a big dish of natto and they put it in front of me and the entire family gathered around to watch, you know, <laughs> sort of see, what is he going to do? Natto is uh, fermented soybeans. Um, so the soybeans are um, covered in a thin layer of um, slime. Um, and then you mix this up with uh, rice and uh, often mustard and some soy sauce. It's, it's really tasty. It's really good. But it's also very messy. So if you're like me and you have facial hair, uh, by the time you're done, your entire face is covered in, in uh, natto slime. Uh, so you have to go take a shower after you eat natto. But it's good for you. Um, uh, tasty stuff. So it's not true that no Americans eat natto, but it's grammatical. And what it means is the set of Americans, you're looking at the set of Americans and the set of natto eaters, and you're saying, the intersection of those sets is empty. There's nothing that's in both of these sets. Okay. I don't know whether we have a food like that in our culture, a food that you feed to people in order to be amused by their attempts to eat it. This is something to think about. Uh, I can tell you the Tagalog version of it, though. I'm sorry. I'll start talking about sets again in a second. The, um, the Tagalog version of this is something called balot. Have I talked about balot in this class? You've had balot, too. You're an adventurous person. <laughs> Not balot, okay. <laughs> yeah, balot, balot is um, a duck's egg that has been allowed to be fertilized. It's a popular food in the Philippines. So people um, sell it in the street. You have balot sellers who walk around saying, balot, pampalakas ng tuhod, which means balot, strengthens your knees. That's apparently the standard thing you say. Um, uh, and balot, uh, it's a duck's egg that's been fertilized and then hard boiled before it hatches. So you've got a hard boiled duck's egg with a duck embryo inside, um, which you're supposed to eat. My, when I was living in the Philippines, my host brother got me, got me a balot and uh, we were in a dark room. He handed me the balot and I went to turn on the light. He was like, no, <laughs> and just, uh, just eat it. Um, and I unfortunately turned on the light, so, uh, so I chickened out. I looked at it, and there's a little duck looking up at me. Like, <laughs> um, pretty weird. OK, so quantifiers, so that's their version of that. Quantifiers then, uh, quantifiers like all or some or no or three, right, are saying things about the interactions of the two sets. Right? So all says the first set. Uh, so if we say the first, in a sentence like all Americans eat natto, uh, the first set is the set of Americans, and the second set is the set of natto eaters. Uh, all says the first set is a subset of the second set. Some says the intersection of these sets is not empty. No says the intersection of these sets is empty. Three says if you look at the intersection of these sets, you will find three things. That has cardinality three. Yeah. Um, that's the kind of meaning that a quantifier has. Okay. Um, if you're already familiar with set theory, it's uh, obviously interesting to try to think about what kinds of intersections between sets quantifiers can state. You know, so um, mathematicians can get sets to tango with each other in all kinds of entertaining ways, right? I mean, there are all kinds of things you can get sets to do. It turns out that uh, natural language quantifiers are what's called conservative, um, which means that you can always replace set number two with the intersection of set number one and set number two and get the same meaning. That is to say, maybe about to do this in a slide, but here we'll do it on the board. If this is set number one and this is set number two, um, I've been talking about quantifiers as though they tell you something about this set and this set. But all of the quantifiers can be stated in terms of this set, set number one, and this area here, the intersection of set number one and set number two. This part of set number two is always uh, uh, irrelevant to the meaning of a quantifier. That's a fact about natural language quantifiers. Um, and it's not a necessary fact. Uh, so here's an example. If I say all opera singers smoke, which I believe to be false, but anyway, um, I'm making a claim about the relationship between the set of opera singers and the set of smokers. I'm saying that the set of opera singers is completely contained in the set of smokers. But that's essentially the same thing. It is the same thing as saying that all opera singers are opera singers who smoke. That is, opera singers are all in the set of smoking opera singers. We don't care about smokers who are not opera singers when we are thinking about the meaning of all opera singers smoke. So if I tell you all opera singers smoke and you begin to tell, talk to me about someone who smokes and is not an opera singer, 
what you're, it may be fun to talk about that, but it's not relevant to the truth of my claim. The truth of my claim is only about the set of opera singers and the set of smoking opera singers. It says that the set of opera singers is completely contained in the set of smoking opera singers. Does that make sense? So if I say all opera singers smoke, and you tell me, oh no, Arnold Schwarzenegger smokes, and he's not an opera singer, uh, you haven't contradicted me. It doesn't matter. You can imagine quantifiers which would not be conservative. So I've just made one up. Here's a quantifier, Glorp. It says, if you add up all of the things in set number one and set number two, so the union of set number one and set number two has cardinality three. I've just made up Glorp. I'll give you an example. It would be true in this picture that Glorp circles are red because if you add up the number of circles and the number of red things, the total is three. There are two circles and one red thing. Yeah. So uh, if there were a quantifier Glorp, then you could say that Glorp circles are red in this picture. There is no quantifier Glorp. Not in English and not in any language on Earth, as far as we can tell. Yeah, so quantifiers don't ever do this kind of thing. Yeah. And this would be a non-conservative quantifier, because in order to evaluate Glorp, you would have to look not just at the part of set number two that's uh, intersecting with set number one, but also at the, the part of set number two that I've hatched out here, right? the part that's not part of set number one. So this is a non-conservative quantifier. And there aren't any. OK. All right, good. So um, just practice some more. So all Brazilians love soccer. Again, it's, it's this danger when you do simple sentences with quantifiers in them that you will find yourself trafficking in stereotypes. This is why I like to use examples like all opera singers smoke, which there isn't a stereotype about, as far as I know. Um, uh, so you know, of course, it's not true that all Brazilians love soccer. It might almost be true. Uh, it says there's a relation between the set of Brazilians and the set of people who love soccer. Namely, the first set is a subset of the second set. Now, if you look at the set of people who love soccer inside that set, you will find all of the Brazilians, the people in the Brazilian set. Okay. Um, let's talk a little more about how we get these sets, uh, just to be slightly more formal about it. So what we'll say is, uh, the set of Brazilians, maybe that's not such a mystery. So all Brazilians love soccer. You're taking the set from the rest of the noun phrase. <laughs> you know, so all Brazilians love soccer. Um, uh, the first set is just the set of Brazilians, the thing that comes after all. That's part of the, part of the noun phrase there. Um, if it were more uh, extensive than just Brazilians, then that set might change. So if I said something like all female Brazilians love soccer, you know, or, all Brazilians from Sao Paulo like, love soccer. We'd have a different set, like Brazilians from Sao Paulo. And then the second set, what we're doing is we're taking the set of things x, such that x loves soccer. We're getting that set by replacing the quantifier, all Brazilians, with a variable. So we start off with all Brazilians love soccer. We're going to replace all Brazilians with a variable, call it x. Right, so x loves soccer. So the second set is the set of x. We have this property, x loves soccer. This is just an attempt to do very slightly more formally what I've been kind of breezing through in the preceding slides. But does any of this seem alarming or, or disturbing? Is it causing unhappiness? Anybody, have you all had your natto this morning? This is good. Maybe I should bring some natto, and I can stand around and watch. It would be revenge. Yeah? I will not bring a balot to class. I'm not sure where I would get one. Um, so it's worth doing this because uh, doing this slight formalization of what we've been doing because, well, uh, I've been carefully giving you an examples in which the quantifier is a subject. But of course, quantifiers don't have to be subjects. You can say things like soccer bores all Americans. Um, here, the first set is going to be the set of Americans. What's the second set? So Americans is a subset of what set? Again, what we do is. Go ahead. X such that soccer bores X. Yeah, X such that soccer bores X. Right? So we take this sentence, we replace all Americans with X, right? and now we have the set of X such that soccer bores X. Yeah. So X doesn't have to be in subject position. That's the only point here. That can be anywhere. OK, so that's how we'll do 
the meaning of quantifiers. So it says Americans, it's a subset of the people whom soccer bores, the X such that soccer bores X. Right? So the quantifier has been replaced with the variable. Yeah? OK. So now we can get back to the ambiguity that I started us off with. And I'll try to do this slowly and carefully. Um, what we're going to see is that a way of thinking about the ambiguity that I started this off with is to think, yeah, you have these two quantifiers that are doing these operations involving the formation of sets. Uh, so in all of the sentences I've given you before, there's only been one quantifier. So it forms these sets and asserts a relation between them. But in a sentence like this, where there are two quantifiers, well, you're going to need to perform that kind of operation twice. And the ambiguity just has to do with the order in which you perform the operations. You know? So do you do the operations for some child first, and then the operations for every puppy? Or do you do the operations for every puppy first, and then the operations for some child? So if I remember my own slides correctly, I think what we're going to do now is work fairly slowly and painfully through what happens if you do the two things in that order. But I'm telling you this now in advance, sort of to give you some hope that you will sort of have an understanding by the time we're done of what the heck is going on here. It's just, what order do you do the operations in? Yeah. That's why there's ambiguity here. You have these two quantifiers, and uh, you have options about which one to interpret first. So if you interpret every first, then you're saying, the set of puppies is a subset of the, thing, the set of things that some child loves. Yeah? And then, if you in interpret that part, you're going to say, uh, what's the set of things that some child loves? Well, it's the set such that the intersection of the set of children with the set of things that loves them is not empty. So if we interpret every first, then this sentence means the set of puppies is a subset of the set of things such that the intersection of the set of children with the set of things that love those things is not empty. Whew! Yeah. If we do the operations in that order, we get that reading. That is, we get the reading, the set of puppies is a subset of the things that some child loves. So some child loves many things, possibly, and among those things is the set of puppies. So every member of the set of puppies is such that the intersection of children, such that there is some child that loves it. And I think I have a picture of that now. Yeah, there. So doing the operations in that order, we get this reading. Every member of the set of puppies has this property, there is some child that loves it. That's a reading this sentence can have. And we can get this reading by doing the interpretation of every puppy first. That's one reading the sentence can have. Yeah? So this is, that's the reading that's pictured here, where there are many puppies and many children. And uh, every puppy is loved by at least one child, possibly more than one. There are also children who love more than one puppy. Children are not monogamous when it comes to puppies. Yes? OK. What if you interpreted some child first? Well, then you'd be saying, take the set of children and the set of things that love every puppy. That intersection is non-empty. So take a deep breath, because we're about to interpret the second part of that. But even before we interpret the second part of that, maybe this is the point at which things are as coherent as they're ever going to get. What this means is there is at least one child that loves every puppy. That is, there's at least one child who's very fond of puppies. That's the other kind of reading we were saying this kind of sentence could have. Uh, so we next interpret that. So the intersection of the set of children and the set of things, such that the set of puppies is a subset of the things that that thing loves, is non-empty. And to put that back into English, it means there is at least one child such that puppies is a subset of the things that X loves. Or to put it another way, there is at least one child such that all puppies are loved by them. Yep. So. Early in this, maybe one of the first things I said today was uh, a sentence like some child loves every puppy, or I think the example back then was someone loves everyone. People have argued that it's ambiguous that it can mean either there is one person who loves everyone or everyone has someone that loves them. And these are both meanings that the sentence can have. And I switched over to people and languages because our intuitions about the difference between the two meanings are a little sharper for that kind of example. Here I'm showing you some mechanics that we can use to get this, uh, this ambiguity. And the mechanics are, uh, involve um, 
allowing yourself to do the operations for interpreting the quantifier, when you have more than one quantifier in a sentence, you're allowed to interpret them in either order. So uh, you're allowed to do the operations for the subject first or the operations for the object first. And depending on which of those things you get, you do, you get these two different readings for the sentence. So far, so good? Sorry, this is a lot to deal with on a Tuesday morning through a mask. Yeah. OK. Great. OK, so here's the sentence, the tree for that sentence. Some child loves every puppy. And we've said, that's an ambiguous tree. All right, so why is the tree ambiguous? There, what I've been now said a couple of times, and who knows, this could be true, uh, is, yeah, you've got these two quantifiers. Uh, you've got to perform operations uh, that uh, form these sets, right? The, the part of the process of interpreting these quantifiers involves forming these sets. And there's nothing in particular telling you what order to perform those operations in. And so uh, you can interpret them in either order. And so you get ambiguities. That's the way I've been talking. That turns out to be a lie, which is kind of interesting. We have lots of good evidence, and I'll show you some of it, that we don't just get to freely choose the order in which we interpret quantifiers. That what really happens uh, is that there is another kind of movement operation. Uh, so I know, you know we've left syntax behind, and maybe some of you were hoping we wouldn't have to see things move anymore. Um, but actually, in semantics, there's also movement going on, possibly movement of an even sneakier and weirder kind. There's lots of evidence that the reason that the sentence is ambiguous is that there's an operation which is optional that takes the object, every puppy, and moves it to a position above some child in the process of interpreting the sentence. Now, um, there are several alarming things about this movement. All of the movements that I've shown you up until now, and so you know, when I first tried introducing you to movement, I think I was showing you things like, you know, Mary devoured a pizza. I was saying, yeah, look, the pizza absolutely has to be here. You know, you can't say uh, Mary devoured, that's out. Uh, so devour uh, selects for a sister and absolutely has to have a sister. And moreover, its sister absolutely has to be right next to it. So if I put an adverb here, it gets bad. So Mary devoured quickly a pizza. That's no good. So we know something about the properties of the devour. It absolutely has to have an object. And the object absolutely has to be right after it. Cannot be anywhere else. And then I said, wait, what about what did Mary devour? And we ended up deciding that what is starting off here, and it's moving up to here. And that's why it's over there. So we said the process of producing a sentence like, what did Mary devour, involves what starting off exactly where it should, as the sister of devour, um, right next to devour. And then there's this other process that doesn't care about what devour wants, this process of WH movement that takes what and moves it to the beginning of the sentence. We saw some languages have this and others don't. Um, I was looking at walls the other day. It turns out roughly a third of the world's languages have this, and English does. Uh, uh, so you take what and you move it to the beginning of the sentence. Yeah. Uh, so every kind of movement that we've seen up until now has been like this. It's been part of an explanation for why you pronounce things in different places than you would expect. Yeah. You would expect devour to have a sister, to have an object that would be right after it. And what isn't there, and it's because of a movement operation. I'm going to give you some evidence now that <clears throat> this ambiguity shows up because you have the option of moving every puppy to a position to the left of some child, higher than some child in the tree. But this had better be a different kind of movement, because this sentence is ambiguous even if you don't see the noun phrases going anywhere else. This is a type of movement called covert movement. Um, and uh, you should all be very suspicious of this, because it's basically, it's, it's, uh, it's like the, um, what's it like? It's like the dark matter that physicists have to posit in order to explain why you know, most of the matter in the universe doesn't seem to be there. Right? So uh, there's all this undetectable matter that's out there. You know, we just haven't detected it yet. Um, somehow when physicists say things like this, we believe them, because you know, they, they can build bombs and things. But, uh, I'm about to say something kind of similar to that. We have some arguments, really good ones. I'll try to show you some of them anyway. 
um, that this thing can move. Uh, and the fact that when it moves, you still pronounce it as though it hadn't moved, uh, this is really interesting. Um, but what it shows is that this is, this is sort of dark matter. Uh, it is moving, it's just not moving in a way that changes the order of the sentence, order of the words. Okay? All of you are making the appropriate face, which is a very skeptical one. I mean, some of you are wearing masks, so I can only see your skeptical eyebrows and eyes, but uh, you know, that's, I, I appreciate that. Um, let me show you some arguments. First, there are some languages. Yeah, so here's another ambiguous example. Most people ate two cakes. Um, uh, that can mean two things, right? It can mean either, what's one thing it can mean? Just softening you up for the next set of slides. Uh, you don't have to use X's and Y's and things. You can just tell me what it seems to mean. Yeah? Most of the people in the room ate each meal for each person. For each person. So there were a whole bunch of cakes, right? And there was a free for all, you know, people could have as many cakes as they wanted. And we were keeping track of how many cakes people wanted. And most people ate two cakes. Right? Some people ate three. There was this Richards guy who ate 12, you know, but, uh, uh, and then, you know, some people didn't eat any. But uh, most people ate two. That's one thing it can mean. What's another thing it can mean? Yeah. There are a total of two cakes from which most people have eaten. Yeah, so um, there were various cakes out there, maybe really big cakes that you could eat a slice of. And we were finding out what the most popular cakes were. And most people ate two cakes, the, um, the vanilla frosted and the chocolate frosted. You know? And then there were you know, a couple other cakes that were not as popular. So we'll concentrate on those. It can kind of mean that. Some of you were raising your eyebrows at that. Yeah, but it can sort of mean that. So one reason to take seriously the idea that this ambiguity comes from an optional movement operation, uh, which you can't see, is that there are languages in which you can see it. So you remember how I said uh, English has WH movement, and there are languages out there that don't, you know, languages like uh, Mandarin or Japanese or Chaha or whatever. Similarly, this operation that takes one quantifier and moves it past another quantifier, uh, you don't get to see it in English, but you do get to see it, for example, in Hungarian. So in Hungarian, the Hungarian translations for uh, most people ate two cakes, yeah, um, have two word orders, each of which means only a single thing. So you either say in Hungarian, I don't speak Hungarian, I won't try to say these sentences. Does anyone here speak Hungarian? Okay, and that's very freeing. I almost feel as though I should try to say these sentences at you now that I know you don't know what Hungarian is supposed to sound like. Um, uh, but I won't. Uh, the first sentence uh, only has one meaning, it, uh, and, and the second sentence also has only one meaning. So you can take these expressions, most people, and from two cakes, and put them in either order. And depending on what order you're in, uh, you only get one reading. So uh, the first sentence means the first reading that was, was offered, the sort of most, most reasonable reading, uh, uh, most of the people ate two kinds of cake. Uh, the second meaning means there were two particular cakes that were the most popular ones. So in Hungarian, the order in which you apply the operations to interpret the quantifiers is not optional, it's completely fixed. It's determined by the order of the phrases. That's what determines what's going on. And the claim is that all languages are Hungarian deep down. Yeah. Um, uh, it's just that some languages are better at this than others. You know, So there are languages like Hungarian, for example, that are really good at being Hungarian. You can just sort of see it right there. And then there are other languages like English that are Hungarian, but uh, they're shy about it. And um, so you don't get to see the relevant kinds of movement. Um, OK. What are we doing? OK. So <clears throat> um, I'm going to show you some more reasons to take this idea seriously. Uh, that uh, this operation, which is called quantifier raising, uh, or QR, um, that it exists. So we'll talk about some of the properties of it. We'll talk about some of the properties of it in the next little while. Uh, here's another sentence with two quantifiers in it. Uh, this is uh, work that I'm, I'm taking from my colleague Danny Fox, who's done a lot of fantastic work on the properties of quantifiers. Uh, uh, so here's an ambiguous sentence. A guard is standing in front of every building. What does this sentence mean? Yes? I was, uh, every building has a different guard standing in 
standing in front of it, or there is one guard that is simultaneously standing in front of it. Yeah, there we go. So it has a sensible reading. Every building is guarded. And it has a, a reading involving a very large guard. Right? Uh, or, you know, maybe lots of really small buildings or something like that. Yeah. Could be. Oh, yeah, no, let's imagine that there's more than one building. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. OK, so those are two things the sentence could mean. So yeah, uh, here are a bunch of buildings, a bunch of guards, uh, one guard per building, or <laughs> a bunch of buildings and one guard who is kind of wide. Yeah? So it could mean, could mean either of those things. That's it. Ah, OK, yes. Yeah. So if the, guards, if the buildings are all in a circle and they're all facing each other, there could be one guard in the middle. A guard is stand, I am, he managed to stand in front of every building by standing you know, right in the center spot. Yes, I suppose it could mean that. I think that's right. Um, let's discount that reading. <laughs> OK, so here's an ambiguity. The kind of ambiguity we've been talking about, you've got these two quantifiers. Um, and you can interpret, and so you know, the first pass on why we got this kind of ambiguity was there's this process of interpreting quantifiers where you uh, figure out what the sets are that the quantifier is relating and you relate them to each other. And if you have a sentence that has two quantifiers in it, you get to do that process. You know, either you've got two quantifiers, quantifier number one and quantifier number two. You either apply that process to quantifier number one first or to quantifier number two first. And then I, I asserted and offered you so far only evidence from Hungarian. Uh, I asserted that there is actually this operation of quantifier raising uh, that has the option of moving one quantifier to a higher position than the other quantifier. And that the, the, the order in which you perform the operations is actually fixed. It's completely determined by the structure that you get after you've done quantifier raising, if you, if you have. Yeah. So what I'm going to do in the next few slides is, is show you some reasons to take that seriously, even, even for English. Um, so here's a sentence that has ambiguity, and the story was going to be, yeah, it's ambiguous because you have the option of leaving every building where it is, uh, or the option of moving every building so that it's higher than a guard. Um, and if you, if you uh, take the option of moving every building so that it's higher than a guard, invisibly, right, uh, without changing the word order, uh, very weird. I have to try to understand what's going on. Then what you do, so the, the, the generalization is that you must interpret the highest quantifier first. So if you do QR of every building higher than a guard, what you're saying is you're going to start by relating the set of buildings to the set of things that a guard is standing in front of. And you're going to say that that first set is completely contained in the second set. Yeah. And then you will, you will interpret the quantifier of guard. So uh, you have this optional operation of QR, uh, and uh, there, there isn't actually any uh, optionality in the order in which you interpret quantifiers. You always interpret the highest quantifier first. That's going to be the, the story. The optionality has to do with the optionality of the application of QR. Um, so here's a sentence with two quantifiers in it, and it's ambiguous. And I'm asserting it's ambiguous because you can do QR. Here's another sentence with two quantifiers in it. A guard said that I should stand in front of every building. Now, is this ambiguous in the same way? No. Right? It doesn't mean. So what, it, what does it mean? Joseph? The guard says that I have to be sufficiently large. Sufficiently large. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. There is one guard who demands that I gain weight. Right? Uh, wants me to be wide enough to stand in front of every building. Yeah, Faith? I interpreted it instead as like, uh, like moving from one building to the next. Ah. Yeah, that's, a, that's a, a more reasonable thing for the guard to ask me to do, isn't it? Um, and I guess it helps that we've switched here to uh, that I should stand in front of every building uh, rather than, so what we had before was a guard is standing in front of every building. Where I guess we could interpret that as meaning that there's a single guard who is walking from building to building and standing briefly in front of them. These are all ways of getting a single guard to do all the work. There's only one guard. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. OK, but it doesn't have the other reading, right? It doesn't mean uh, there was one guard who wanted me to stand in front of the Stata Center, and another guard who wanted me to stand in front of the Student Center, and another guard who wanted me to stand in front of the MIT Museum. Right? It doesn't mean that. Yeah. All right, why not? Because right, you know, we've got two quantifiers. Right? Why can't we interpret these quantifiers in any order we want? 
Well, if we believe in QR, we have an answer to that. We get to say, what's special about this example and, and distinguishes it from the examples we had before is that a guard is in the matrix clause and there's an embedded clause, an embedded CP. That I should stand in front of every building. Yeah, that's, a, that's an embedded clause. Is that clear? Should I draw a tree? Is it clear? So say is taking as its sister a CP, that I should stand in front of every building. And what we're learning is that although there is this optional operation, QR, that can get one quantifier past another, it can't get you out of a clause. We're going to have to figure out what counts as a clause, but apparently this counts as a clause. You know, there's some like limitation on how far you can QR. How about this one? A guard seems to be standing in front of every building. Is that ambiguous? I think so, yeah. So it means either looks like every building is guarded or man, that guard is wide, yeah. Or man, that guard is running hard to be in front of every building at once, yeah. Or look how clever that guard is at geometry. He's managed to stand in front of every building at once. Yeah? <laughs> Lucky thing for him, they all face each other, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so it has two, two meanings, you know. <laughs> Um, one with a very wide or clever or fast-moving guard, and then the other more normal reading where it's like every building has a guard. Yeah, so either every building is such that there's a guard standing in front of it, or there is a guard who is somehow standing in front of every building. Yeah. Okay, so yes, this is ambiguous. Um, how about this one? I seem to a guard to be standing in front of every building. Is that ambiguous? No. This is a sentence about one guard who, who needs rest, yeah. <laughs> who needs to be taken off duty and you know, convinced to, to get some rest. Yeah. This is a guard who thinks that, I, I don't know, maybe he goes to one building and I'm there and he goes to another building and I seem to be there too and he's seeing me everywhere and you know, he's, this guard has problems, yes, in this sentence, yes. But the, the question still remains, right? The, the other reading, you're absolutely right, but the other reading that this could have, right, would be one with something like, every building has this property. I seem to a guard to be standing in front of it. That, that would be a reading that would be like, for this building, there's a guard who thinks that I'm standing in front of it, and for this other building, there's another guard, maybe a different guard, who thinks that I'm standing in front of it, right? That's a, that's a story where um, there are lots of guards who uh, don't necessarily believe that I am simultaneously standing in front of lots of buildings. They just all, they're all, their hallucinations are more simple than that. They, they just all see me in front of one building, one particular building, maybe the building they're supposed to be guarding. Right? All of them are taking the day off because they're like, oh yeah, that Richards guy, he's guarding that building. <laughs> yeah? Yeah? Uh, some, somehow it didn't register to me that you were the one, not the guard. That yep. Was yeah, 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 yeah. So that's what the second, second sentence means. But the point is that it only means one thing. It means there is one guard who thinks that I'm standing in front of every building. It doesn't mean every building is such that there is some guard who thinks I'm standing in front of it. It doesn't mean that. Yeah. Could it be that a guard in the first sentence, it's a singular phrase, but it could refer to any number of people, whereas I seem to a guard. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, I think, th there was a related comment earlier, and, and I think that's onto something, but, but it's, it's sort of describing the problem that we have, right? So a guard, if it's a guard is standing in front of every building, or a guard seems to be standing in front of every building, then yeah, a guard can either be one guard, who's in many places at once, or it can be many guards, one for each building. That's the original ambiguity, right? That's what, you know, a guard has that, that power that it can do that. But why can't it do it in the second sentence? the question, like why, why can't the second sentence mean there are three guards, let's call them A, B, and C, and guard A thinks that I'm standing in front of building number one, and guard B thinks that I'm standing in front of building number two, and guard C thinks that I'm standing in front of building number three. Right? 
Why can't it mean that? When you know the first sentence can mean A seems to be standing in front of building one, B seems to be standing in front of building two, C seems to be standing in front of building three. We can play that game, the alphabet and number game, with the first example, but not with the second example. We're trying to figure out why. Bless you. Yep. We're trying to figure out why. Here's a possible story about why. We went through this very fast, so I won't blame anybody if you don't remember this. But when we were doing a guard seems to be standing in front of every building, sentences like that, um, what we said was that there's a, a movement operation going on in sentences involving seams, this kind of sentence involving seams, where seam is followed by an infinitive. Um, that what's going on is that uh, the guard, the thing that ends up in subject position, starts out in the embedded clause, here's a guard, and it's raising, moving up to here. There's NP movement, um, so A movement. I'm sorry, I know it's, it's dangerous taking 24900 from a syntactician because I keep trying to change the subject back to syntax. Uh, it's, you know, so now we're gonna talk about syntax some more. This is a bit of syntax that we talked about. I tried to convince you that Sentences like this, sentences with seam and an infinitive in them, the subject of the whole thing started out in the embedded clause. One of the kinds of arguments had to do with properties of idioms, you know, that you could say things like the shit seems to have hit the fan, where we think that the idiom is the shit hit the fan, um, uh, you know, that the shit needs to be somewhere near hit the fan. But it's way over there, and the story was, yeah, that's because it starts out in the embedded clause, and it undergoes NP movement into the matrix clause. Uh, so it moves, it raises. Does that sound familiar at all? Have you all expunged the terrible memory of syntax? From, yeah? That's the way we were talking before. So we said a bit ago that QR is clause bound, right? There we go. That's us saying that QR is clause bound. A guard said that I should stand in front of every building. I said, yeah, why isn't that ambiguous? Well, it's not ambiguous because every building is inside an embedded clause that doesn't contain a guard. Yeah. So QR can't take every building and move it past a guard. And then I think I also said, if we're saying things like that, we eventually will have to explain what kinds of things, what, what we mean by clauses exactly. So clause has to include things like that I should stand in front of every building. What about, yeah, what about a sentence like uh, a guard seems to be standing in front of every building? Well, here we get ambiguity. And it could be that we're getting ambiguity here because, well, every building every building has the option of undergoing QR here, this piece of chalk I'm using is very small. I'm blaming my illegible handwriting on the poor quality of my chalk. I should, uh, I'm, it's foolish of me to pick up a new piece of chalk because that will blow that excuse out of the water in just a second. Um, uh, it could be that, so here's a guard in the end. It could be that there's ambiguity in a guard seems to be standing in front of every building because every building can undergo QR up to here to a position above every guard. That if, if that's possible, then that would be telling us that, well, this TP down here to be standing in front of every building doesn't count as a clause. But you can QR out of that. And so when we say that QR is clause bound, we don't mean this kind of thing. We mean tensed clauses. But another possibility, right, is that we do actually mean tensed clauses, and that the reason, uh, we do actually mean every TP, that QR out of this TP is impossible, and that it's not possible to QR up to here, it's only possible to QR here. And that the reason that you get ambiguity in a guard seems to be standing in front of every building goes like this. Every building can QR to a position in the periphery of that embedded clause. And a guard started out in that embedded clause. And that's enough. This would be a story where you know, we're already, if we're doing QR at all, we're slowly hopefully getting accustomed to the idea that part of interpreting sentences will be interpreting things in places where we cannot necessarily see them. 
Yeah, so we can take things and move them invisibly to other places and interpret them there. Yeah. So in a guard seems to be standing in front of every building, there are two invisible movements going on. One is we are invisibly moving every building, maybe not all the way up to here, but just to the edge of the embedded clause, the embedded TP. And we are invisibly taking a guard, which started out in the embedded subject position and moved up to here and underwent NP movement, and we're putting it back. So we end up with every building above a guard. And a reason to take that, if you're stunned, I don't blame you for being stunned. So there are these two invisible things happening. A reason to take that idea seriously is the fact at the bottom of this. So I seem to a guard to be standing in front of every building. We can get a story about why we're not getting ambiguity here if we're willing to say, no, QR can't, in fact, get out of a, an infinitival clause, like to be standing in front of every building. It can only get to the edge of such a clause. And what's special about this example is that a guard is not inside the embedded clause to be standing in front of every building. It's an argument of seam. Yeah. So it's in the higher clause. I don't know why I did this with a blackboard. I think I have slides here. So let me show you the slides. Maybe they will help. So we think that a guard seems to be standing in front of every building involves a step of movement. A guard is moving out of the embedded clause and into the matrix subject position. Um, and I see now I don't actually have slides that help with any of this. So uh, the reason we're getting this ambiguity is not that every building can QR past the higher position of a guard. It can only QR past the lower position of a guard. And that's good enough. So we get to interpret the lower position of the guard as well as the higher invisible position of every building. So we get a handle on all of these facts as long as we're willing to posit these particular invisible kinds of movements. Learning something about QR, when we say it's clause bound, we mean it can't get any further than TP, any kind of TP, tensed or non-tensed. Now, Danny Fox also discovered something else that's cool about QR. He's discovered many cool, th cool things. And the next thing is quite long and complicated. Um, so maybe I will pause here and take questions. Do people have questions about this? Would you like me to go through it more, more slowly or carefully? I've been talking so far as though QR is always optional. Uh, Danny Fox has discovered, it was one of his early discoveries. Uh, it's actually more complicated than that. What we'll see, and we'll start doing this next time, is that um, you can only do QR if it's going to change the meaning of the sentence. Um, so if you have two quantifiers, you can QR the lower quantifier past the higher quantifier if that's going to give you a different meaning, a meaning you wouldn't have had if the if the QR hadn't happened. If you have a sentence where QR wouldn't affect the meaning, it can't happen. Um, and what we'll do next time, we'll start with this next time, is we'll develop the tools to discover that, tools that Danny Fox discovered, and uh, then I'll show you that that's true. So any further questions about any of this? At this point, you should all be sort of weirded out, right? Suddenly things are moving around in an invisible way, and this is part of interpreting them. Yeah. If QR can only happen if it will change the meaning of a sentence, isn't that sort of indicates that the English language and I imagine other languages that allow this are like built they build in the ambiguity uh -huh. as opposed to trying to like mitigate the ambiguity? Oh, I see what you mean. I think I see what you mean. Um I mean, the claim in the end is that the structures that are interpreted are, are never ambiguous. Uh, you either do QR or you don't, right? And if you do QR, then you get one reading. And if you don't do QR, then you get another reading. And English is one of the languages in which you don't get to see QR. And the result is that the sentence is ambiguous because you can't tell whether QR has happened or not. There are languages out there like Hungarian where you can see QR, and so the sentences are not ambiguous. Um, but yes, that means there are certain kinds of ambiguities in English that don't exist in other, some other languages, uh, uh, like Hungarian. There are other languages where it's more complicated than that. So there are languages like um, uh, Japanese, and German actually has a version of this too. But in Japanese, um, if you have two quantifiers, their scope with respect to each other is unambiguous, unless you move one of them past the other. And then it becomes ambiguous. So it, it's. On basically, it's as though mo the movement operation that moves one quantifier past the other could be QR or it could be something else. 
right? And so you can't tell whether you have done QR of that thing or not. But there is no invisible QR in Japanese, something like that. Cool. All right, good. Thank you for coming and braving you know, my possible cold viruses. I apologize for exposing you to them. And um, I will see you on Thursday. <laughs>